Family of Faith here at Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, we want to welcome you to our morning worship hour. If you are visiting us for the very first time online or through Facebook or on our website, we want to welcome you into our worship service as well. And when we get through this on the other side, uh, we would love to have you come and visit with us. Now, for our church members at home and those who are watching for the very first time, this is a worship service and we want you to worship our Lord and Savior in spirit and truth. You're you're quarantined with your family. So this is what we're going to ask you to do. We're going to ask you to participate this morning. We want you to have a physical act of worship. So that means when the songs are being sung, we want you to stand up and sing the songs. When we read our scripture, we want you to stand up and uh, honor the reading of God's word. Participate on every, every level because I can assure you, it will make a difference in your home and it will make a difference in your life as well. We want to also encourage you to tune in tonight at 6 o'clock. We'll be going live via Facebook and we will begin our Holy Week services. Today is Palm Sunday. We, we celebrate the fact that our Lord and Savior entered into the holy city to the cries, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We also have the assurance where two or more are gathered in his name. There he will be. So today, we worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you today for the opportunity that is ours to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray that our worship would be worthy in your sight, that everything that we do would please you. And Father, when we are done with our time here, we will have said it was good to be in the house of the Lord. We pray for those who are watching right now. And we ask that you would bless them and their families during these uncertain days. Help them to hold fast to their faith because you have told us that nothing will separate us from your love. We claim that promise today, and this is your hour, and we give it to you freely. In your son's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Hey! 
special time during our worship where our children gather with me and we have a special message just for them but since we're in these uncertain days and everybody's pretty much at home we've asked our children to bring a stuffed animal up there that represents them and I've been just excited every Sunday and to look on Facebook and see pictures of children gathered around a computer or gathered around a television set and they actually get to see their little guys here. And you, as you would know, Judge Lee is already misbehaving right here. He's trying to, he is being the snake that is crawling all over the place here. So Judge Lee, we're going to make you behave. You have to sit by the preacher today. Have you ever gotten so mad at your brother or your sister or a friend that you just said to them, I'm not talking to you. Don't talk to me. I don't want to talk to you. I, I can remember at times having three brothers that would make me upset, and I would, I would say to them, I'm not, I'm not talking to you ever again. And then one of them would say, well, how long is that going to last? And I'd say, I don't know. And then I would, before I know it, I'm talking to them again. But sometimes we give people the silent treatment. We get mad. We get angry. And we just don't say anything to people. I'm not really sure that that's the way that God wants us to treat one another. But there are also moments in our life when we think that God is silent. Even you as children pray for certain things and they don't turn out the way you wanted them to. And then you think, was God silent? No. God answers every prayer. And those prayers are sometimes answered yes, sometimes they're answered no, and sometimes they're answered not now. And sometimes when he answers a prayer differently than how we prayed, we wonder, does he not care? Does he not love us? God loves us all the time. But he knows what's best for your life. And sometimes you ask your parents to explain certain things to you, and they don't. That's the way it is with God. He answers all of our prayers, but sometimes he just doesn't give us an explanation. But trust me, boys and girls, he knows what's best for you, and you can trust him with your entire life. I want you to take that with you this week, okay? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity with, with our children to bring them a special message to allow them to participate in this time. And Father, there are moments when you, you seem silent, but you're standing right beside us. And we are reminded that nothing separates us from the love of God. We pray this prayer in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. To see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of wood. This the power.
to see the pain written on your face bearing the awesome weight of sin every bitter thought every evil deed crowning your blood-stained brow this
Bibles to the book of Job, the Old Testament, and also we want you to look in the gospel according to Mark, the 15th chapter, reading verse 21 through 27, and then we'll drop down and read verses 33 through 36. Again, I want to remind you that our life groups will be meeting today at 5 o'clock, so you can make sure to tune in. That will be live stream. And Ricky Pounders will be leading that uh, Bible study today. And tonight at 6 o'clock, if you would like to be a part of our Holy Week service, I would encourage you to come and uh, not come, but tune in so that you can listen to the last seven words of our Lord and Savior from the cross. Tonight, that series will begin with the plea, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. While you're at home, you should have an outline. We emailed that to you, and if you are not on our email list, you may go to our Facebook page, and you can print that off, and you can have it, or you can just take notes where you are. Today we're talking about the cross and the silence of God. Hear with me now the word of our Lord from Job, the 23rd chapter, beginning in verse 1. Then Job replied, Even today my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy in spite of my groaning. If I only knew where to find him. Now you've got to realize, Job is talking about God here. And so he says, If I only knew where to find him. If I could only go to his dwelling." I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would find out what he would answer me and consider what he would say to me. Would he vigorously oppose me? No, he would not press charges against me. There the upright can establish their innocence before him. And there I would be delivered forever from my judge. Now let's look in the gospel according to Mark, the 15th chapter, beginning in verse 1. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which literally means the place of of the skull. Then they'd offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Now let's skip down to verse 33. At the sixth hour, 
darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And in the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? When some heard those standing near, they said, listen, he is calling Elijah. One of the men ran and filled a sponge with wine and vinegar and put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now, let's leave him alone, they said, and see if Elijah comes and takes him down. And this is the word of God, for the people of God. May God add his blessings to the reading of his holy and inspired word, and all God's people together said, amen. Thank you. You may be seated, and you may be seated at home as well. I wish that I could tell you that your life was always going to be filled with happiness and joy. When I think about the congregation of Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, it is filled with people who are so special to me. I love you with all of my heart. I desire to be with you, and, and sometimes when we are having a service such as this, the longing for you is so great that, that it moves me to tears. And I wish that I could talk with you one-on-one -on -one and tell you that, that you're never going to experience any difficulties. You're never going to have any disappointments in life. You're never going to have any frustrations. And you're never going to experience a heartache. But unfortunately, that's not true. And we're finding that to be true each and every day in the nation in which we live. Christianity is not an insurance policy that keeps us away from all of sorrow and grief. Oh, there are a lot of preachers out there that are going to preach a, a name it, claim it gospel, a prosperity gospel. They'll tell you that the only thing that you need to do is just think positive thoughts and trust God, and God is going to grant you the desires of your heart. But the reality of the situation is life is often hard, and it's dark. And it's difficult. There are some of you that are listening today that, that know the, the pain and the suffering that you endured while a cancer was racking your body. There are, are some of you that know the grief of a rebellious child who has turned away from everything you ever taught him or her. Some of you know the, the heartache of, of losing a loved one to death. You, you, you've stood by an open grave with a casket and a spray of flowers on top of it, and that individual was your whole life. And your heart has been breaking as you've watched this memorial service unfold. I've gone into hospital rooms, talked with people that have asked questions, why is this happening to me? I, I thought I was doing everything that the Lord wanted me to do. Folks, we need to realize suffering is a part of life. It's a part of my life, and it's a part of your life. We're all going to go through storms. We're all going to go through those difficult days. As a matter of fact, there are really three different types of folks. There are those that are in a storm, those coming out of a storm, and those about to go through a storm. With all of the darkness that is in our world, so many people experience famine, they experience poverty, they experience disease, they experience homelessness. I mean, just look at what has taken place in our world just in the last few years alone. We're just going to set aside what's been taking place in the last few months with COVID-19 and the coronavirus. Tornadoes have become habitual in our county and in our city, in Columbus. We hear about hurricanes each and every year, and it seems as though they come earlier and earlier, even before hurricane season. There are earthquakes that take the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. We're constantly under the threat of terrorism and even war. There are violent crimes 
that are committed each and every day, not just in our inner cities, but they are, they are executed here in our own hometown and in our state. And right now, as we are watching this pandemic unfold before our eyes, and we are watching people die by the thousands, now they're saying a, a, a relatively conservative number of people who will die to COVID-19, the coronavirus, a conservative number would be anywhere from 175,000 to 200,000 in our nation alone. That is more people that died in the Korean War. That's more people that died in Vietnam and in the Persian Gulf combined. And there are a lot of people that are saying, why is God silent in the midst of all of this suffering? Last night, Franklin Graham was interviewed on Fox News. He's recently set up portable hospitals in Central Park, and the question was asked, did you ever think that you would be setting up your operation in Central Park in New York City? He said, no, never thought that that was possible. And as the interview unfolded, the, the reporter asked him because Graham had earlier made the statement that all of his doctors and all of his medical personnel were Christians. And he said, what we will be doing is we will not only be taking care of their physical needs, we are going to be taking care of their spiritual needs as well. To which the reporter said, well, you better get ready because there are going to be a lot of people questioning why God is allowing this to happen. Why isn't he doing something about this when it seems to affect good people? Because there is suffering all around us and we're living, it seems, with this dark cloud over all of us. But I'm reminded about what John said. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot comprehend it. There are a lot of times when we pray and God seems to be silent. I think there was a place where God was the most silent. It was at the cross. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now listen closely. Those aren't just words of Jesus. Those are your words, they are my words, and they are the words of millions of people today. My God, my God, why have you forsaken us? Matthew and Mark are the only two gospel writers who record these words. And, and, and I want us to think for a moment, what would cause Jesus to cry out to his father. And I want you to realize this. And you'll find this out a, bit, a little bit later on because we'll be covering this scripture again during our Holy Week services. Whenever Jesus referred to God during his ministry, he always referred to him as Father, Abba, Daddy. This is the first time he addresses him simply as God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What type of cry was this of Jesus from the cross? Well, first, I believe it was a cry of delirium. We can never underestimate the agony and the pain and the suffering that he endured for six hours on that cross for your sins and mine. Journal of American Medical Association published an article describing the physical death of Jesus, the pain and the horror and the suffering that he endured for those hours on the cross. And there's no denying that it was awful. However, when you think about it, he died relatively quickly, six hours. There were others who would hang on a cross 
hours among hours and bleed from one day into the next. His suffering was physical, but it was more than that. Every sin that you have ever committed, every sin that I have ever committed, every sin that anyone who ever committed, who ever walked on this planet, those sins were in his body. And as he was crying out for the very first time, he was experiencing the absence of a presence. I would imagine there was also a cry of doubt. Had Jesus now come to a point in time in his ministry where, where he begins to doubt what it was all about? How could this be happening to me? Do you remember the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane? As he prayed with such fervor that they say that drops of blood were pouring forth from his forehead. As he prayed, Father, if there's any other way to do this, let's do it. But not my will, but thy will be done. And now on the cross, he's feeling forsaken. Had it come to this, a doubt, that wasn't my doubt. I mean, that wasn't his doubt, that was my doubt and your doubt. But I would imagine that it also could have been a cry of depression and desertion. On the cross, our Lord and Savior is isolated, rejected. Here's food for thought. Where were his disciples? His mother was there. Mary Clopas was there. Mary Magdalene was there. John was there. Where were his brothers and sisters? His siblings? I mean, think about it. Peter. Just earlier had said, Lord, if everybody else forsakes you, I will be by your side to the very end. Where was Peter? Oh, it wasn't just Peter. Where was Matthew? How about Zacchaeus? Nicodemus? Jairus? Jairus' daughter, whom he raised from the dead. The Gerasene demoniac. All these people that he ministered to. Where were part of the crowd of 5,000 that he fed with just a few fish and a few loaves of bread? In his darkest hour, in his darkest time, he felt depressed, deserted. And you felt that way as well. And I can tell you, over the next few weeks, it's going to get worse. As we are quarantined inside of our houses and our normal lives are no longer normal and we are going to be crying out in our time of agony. We're going to be crying out in our time of desertion and we are going to be crying out in our days of depression as well. But I want you to move further. Notice it could be in a cry of dereliction. Total Abandonment by God. God forsaking God. Who could ever imagine, as one scholar put it? But it was a cry of absolute isolation. One of the things that has been so difficult for our medical world is to deal with the coronavirus in such a way that they feel helpless. As one doctor said, you know, I am used to staying with my patient and checking on my patient and making sure that my patient has everything that he or she needs. But now, they are in rooms by themselves in isolation. We have church members who have self-quarantined because they have been exposed to this virus. They have felt alone. 
and deserted. You know what a derelict ship is? A derelict ship is a ship with no passengers. A derelict ship is a ship with no crew. A derelict ship is a ship with no captain. And there are times when we feel the same way. However, I think the cry of Jesus was a cry of identification. Today, more than any time in your life, God feels our suffering. He feels our pain. He feels our heartache. He feels our sorrow. Those around the cross that day when he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, they said, whoa, he's, he's calling down Elijah. Eloi could have been mistaken for Elijah. But he was basically asking the question, why? Have you ever known the silence of God in your life? And you've asked the question, why? If you haven't, you might be living in denial because I believe we all have. It's quite normal, to be honest with you. In the midst of suffering, in the midst of separation, we often ask that question, why? Why? I've stood by some of the most devout Christians in their time of distress, of suffering the, the death of a loved one, even a tragedy or grief, and they turn to me and they say, Pastor, why is this happening to me? I've done funerals for babies. talking about heartbreak and heart riching. I've done memorial services for teenagers, children. I have had mothers and fathers weep uncontrollably on my shoulder. And I have felt the heartache of every tear that they have cried. They've asked the same question that Jesus asked. Why? Why? You see, it's painfully real. If we're honest, there are a lot of times that you and I feel an overwhelming absence of a presence. The absence of a presence that's always been with us. The absence of a presence that has seen us through difficult times. And we call out to God and he seems to be muzzled or silent. We're almost like Jeremiah who said, Will you be like a deceitful brook to me, like a spring that fails? As he said, I sat alone because your hand was upon me. Martin Marty's wife died after suffering cancer and he later wrote a book, The Cry of Absence. And in that book, Marty talks about how he dealt with his grief of losing his wife. And he said, I, I went to the book of Psalms for comfort. Well, if you ever go to the book of Psalms for comfort, you better realize that about half of the songs, Psalms are laments. They are written by people who are wondering where God is in their time of grief and in their time of sorrow. There are some who are so convinced of the absence of God in the midst of their suffering that they become angry with God and reject Him altogether. A storm in an individual's life, a catastrophe that an individual may have to deal with will do one of two things. It will either drive them closer to God or it will move them further away from Him. I mean, there are people that are saying this today. You know there can't be a God. You know in your heart of hearts there can't be a God. How can things be as they are and God exist and God love us? Let me tell you something. We can't be complete individuals without the possibility of suffering. 
That's hard for us to grasp. We cannot be complete individuals without the possibility of some type of suffering in our lives. You see, you can't be healthy without the possibility of sickness racking your body. We've seen that over the last month. Healthy individuals reduced to just being a puddle of themselves and people who are healthy die. We live in a world where courage doesn't mean anything if we don't have the possibility of cowardly acts. We can't have forgiveness if there's not a such thing as sinfulness. You can't have hope without the possibility of hopelessness. And you can't have faith without the possibility of some type of doubt. You see, I'm convinced without the possibility of suffering and pain, growth and maturity for the Christian is impossible. Think back in your life right now. When did you experience the most growth as a child of God? I can assure you, it did not come when everything was coming up roses. When you were singing zippity doo da, zippity a, my oh my, what a wonderful day. You're not growing then. You grow in those dark moments when you wonder if you can face another day. As the Apostle Paul said, your grace is sufficient. Wallace Hamilton recorded an experience that he had when he and his wife and his mother-in-law and four-year-old son went on a trip to the North Carolina mountains. Uh, his wife and mother-in-law decided to go into town and shop and they asked Mr. Hamilton if he could watch his son for just a few hours. Now let me tell you something. Mamas, you need to realize that when you leave your child with your husband, there is potential danger. There is potential danger because they're going to do things that they're not going to tell you about. They'll do it. I know you love your husband and I know he's a good man and I know that he has good intentions. But when you leave him alone with your child, you just need to realize that everything's on the table. And if he starts struggling, he's going to re resort to things that you would never imagine. But Dr. Wall, uh, Dr. Dr. Hamilton took the little boy outside and he was playing and Dr. Hamilton was reading a book. Kind of half watching him, half not, like we guys are prone to do. A and he looked over his book to see John, his son, walking into the woods. And so he said, I think I'll just watch this and kind of follow behind and not let him know that I'm there. And he said, that little boy walked for almost a mile. Four years old. And then he realized he was lost. He didn't know his dad was hiding behind a tree. So little John started crying. And about that time, Dr. Hamilton stepped out from behind a tree and said, John, you want to go home? He said, I do, but I don't know where home is. And with that, Dr. Hamilton walked over, took him by the hand, and led him back to the place where they were staying. Later on, Dr. Hamilton said he was reminded of that incident. And he said it reminded him of his own life. He said God had given him the freedom to wander off on his own many times. He said sometimes I wandered off by choice. Other times I wandered off by accident. And that's how God deals with you and me. We get to choose today. Good or evil. Right or wrong. His way or the ways of the world. You see, we can never be the people that God wants us to be without freedom. 
God gives you a choice today. He's not going to coerce you and force you to follow him. He's not going to make you obey the natural laws of the universe. You have a choice. At the cross of Christ, you and I discover that God gives us the same answer in silence that he gave Jesus at Golgotha. Have you ever just considered how much silence came with the ministry and the life of Jesus? How much silence? Just for a moment. On the night that he was born in Bethlehem, just a few shepherds came. The rest of the world was silent. When the wise men came later on and brought their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh and presented them to the child, we are told in Luke 2.52 that the child grew in wisdom and in statue and in favor with God and man. And then there's just a veil of silence. No words written. Nothing recorded about his life. All of a sudden, he appears at the age of 12 in the temple with his father and mother. They start caravanning back to Nazareth, look around, can't find Jesus. He's in the temple teaching and preaching. But a veil of silence after that. Most of his life, think about it. Most of his life is unknown to us. He launches his ministry around the age of 30, 31. And time and time again, even during his ministry, there were moments that he was silent. That he didn't say a word. When the Syrophoenician woman came to him and said, Can you heal my demon-possessed child? He said nothing to her. When he stood before Pilate, and Pilate said, Don't you understand the charges that are levied against you? Don't you know of what they're accusing you of right now? Silence. As he hung on the cross, then God seemed silent. As Jesus said, My God... God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why are you silent? Most of us can handle a lot of things. What we can't handle is silence. I can remember a time in my life that I would really like to go back and change. It was a conflict between my mother and myself. Oh, it was over something silly. I was in college and I had done something and she had gotten angry with me and so I just decided, you know what? I'm an adult. I can play this game too. So I just wouldn't speak to her. For about two days, she would talk to me. I wouldn't even acknowledge her presence. I can't imagine the heartache that I put her through for two days. And I remember her coming into my room and saying, I can handle your anger. What I can't handle is the silence. So what does it mean to you and me when God seems to be silent? Listen closely and write this one down. Rather than an explanation, God gives us his presence. You see, when you and I pray, We're looking for an answer. But a lot of times, we're looking for an explanation. 
We want God to, to explain to us, justify his actions, justify his silence. And listen, God doesn't know you any explanation. Job found no easy answers. As a matter of fact, I love it when he, when he has this argument with God. And he said, where can I go that I can present my case before you as if God didn't know what Job was going through at that time in his life? Job needed to realize that he had no chips before God. You can't bargain with somebody when he holds all the chips. And that's the way it was with God. But God listened to him and God will listen to an honest prayer. When you're frustrated, when you're feeling alone, when you're feeling depressed, when you're feeling isolated, that is when your relationship with God can be the most special. Because he will hear. Suffering is not a, always a punishment for sin. Sometimes suffering is just a part of life. Scripture reminds us that it rains on the just and the unjust. And that's why we as Christians, as we are going through these perilous days, we need to be careful about what we say about this virus. We need to be careful about equating what is happening now to what happened in the Old Testament. Because, dear friends, when the first Passover began, every one of God's children were protected. That's not the case right now. Be careful to try to explain this situation. It's a fact of life, and it's just part of life. There is no explanation. But God has said nothing will separate us from his love. L.D. Johnson's daughter was killed on an icy highway at the age of 23. He struggled with her death as all of us as parents would, no matter how old our children are and he penned these words for the Christian there is an answer but not an explanation he pointed to the cross of Jesus Christ the incarnation bodily form of God and he went on to say this God doesn't abolish the hurts, but he shares in them. So when you hurt, you do not hurt alone. When you grieve, you don't grieve alone. God feels everything that you feel. And more than a simple answer, He gives us his presence. There are moments when God seems to be so distant from us. And the reason he feels so distant from us is, there, is because there have been moments in our life when we've been so close to him. You, you, you've known what it's like to feel the warmth of his arms around you. you. You've known what it's like to feel in step with him. You have known what it's like to be like Enoch who walked with God. And now you begin to sing, Lord, to my heart, bring back the springtime. So you have to ask yourself this question. Who is moved? Is it God? Or is it you? Scripture tells us He is the same today as He was yesterday. He will be the same tomorrow. So if that's the very nature of God, that's the very nature of God. 
And the answer to the question, who moved? Well, that would be us. There are a lot of expressions that we attribute to Scripture that aren't in God's Word. I've had people argue with me all the time, but I have yet to have anybody come and prove it. You know, I've had folks say, you know, God never puts more on you than what you can handle. Really? Tell that to the people in New York. New Orleans. State of Washington. You've also heard in Scripture... You take one step, God takes two. No. He took every step to Calvary. And today, He expects you to take every step to Him. But when you take that step, you'll find His arms wide open. You'll find that even in the silence, he's been there. Do you pray with me? Father, we thank you today for an opportunity that is ours to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, I thank you today that even in the silence, even in the darkness, you are there. You were with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the fiery furnace. You were with Daniel in the lion's den. You were with your son even as he hung on the cross. Because you were in Christ Jesus, reconciling the world unto yourself. And so I pray that in these dark days, we would turn our eyes to you, and look full in your wonderful face, that we would experience the warmthness that comes by walking daily with you. Father, we thank you that we have the time of, of invitation. And we want to be sensitive to the movement of your spirit. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Today there may be a spiritual decision that you need to share with us you need to share with somebody you might be watching this broadcast in the hotel room or on your back porch at work God is not limited by time nor space the work of the Holy Spirit can begin to work in your heart we'd like to hear from you you can call any spiritual decision you need to share we will we'll listen and help you guide you through those days of giving your heart to Christ rededicating your life or finding a place where you can serve and that might very well be here once these days of isolation and quarantine are over we serve an awesome God, a God of second chances, third chances and fourth chances so you just call those numbers or text there will be somebody answer. We also have a time of our worship service where we want to worship our Lord and Savior through our tithes and our offerings. I had a friend of mine the other day that inboxed me and said, I know churches have to be going through a difficult time. Churches aren't exempt. So there are many ways that you can give. You can go to our webpage. If you go to our webpage, there's just a little block that says give and you can uh, 
hit that and make an online donation. You can mail a check and you'll see our address right there. You can set up a bank draft or if you're in our community, we'll still be outside today. We're not congregating in groups of 10 or more, but you can come to the portico over here to my left and we'll be out there to receive the offering today. That has been such a blessing because we get to see you. There are times we weep and there are times that we laugh. But we love to see you. Don't forget this afternoon at 5 o'clock, Life Group, 6 o'clock, Holy Week begins. I'm sorry you're stuck with me this year. I'll be preaching every night this week all the way through Saturday. And then we'll have Easter. People say, what are you going to do for Easter? Can I just go ahead and say we're going to do this? I understand you're frustrated and we're not really under the pressure of what anybody else is going to do. But we've been asked to not gather in groups of 10 or more. And somebody has said, well, why not just go out in our cars? I don't think that's the spirit of what we've been asked to do. If our government officials have asked us to do something to slow down this pandemic, we need to do our part. But don't you worry. Resurrection Sunday is coming. And we will celebrate like we have never celebrated. That I can promise you. Now, if you will, stand and allow me to voice our benediction. May the God of grace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, May he equip you with everything good for doing his will. May he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, the honor and glory forever and ever. And all God's people together said, Amen. Mm-hmm.